Hello, this is Alan Green. Many of you, you will know that I have a lifelong interest in motorcycles, and in particular, the world of classic bikes. Having dabbled, restored, bought and sold bikes since my teens, the past 15 to 20 years has seen an explosion of interest in the sector, not to mention some spectacular tax-free investment returns. Articles by Paul Jason on investing in classic bikes have been featured in The Times, The Financial Times, The Mail and The Telegraph. Paul is, of course, better known as the motorcycle broker, and he joins us today. Welcome, Paul. Good to see you. Good to see you, Alan. Thank you very much. OK, so before we get into investing into classic bikes, can you provide us with an overview of the services that are provided by the motorcycle broker? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, what we do, it's a bespoke service. We talk to customers to find out what they like. They're buying a story. It's about the story of the motorcycle. And we um, find out what they like because you shouldn't invest in things that are ugly and all that you hate because you will end up selling them at the wrong time. Um, we find out what they like that we know will go up. And we use a lot of data to be able to predict it. And we've always been very conservative in our predictions. Um, we also uh, get those bikes and we make sure they, they commission us to buy the bike. We find them an investment grade example. Now, a lot of the motorcycles that we get, they come in and you'll see it's a 40,000 euro restoration done by the best people in Europe. It might take us two to three weeks to get that motorcycle even running, let, let alone before we set that motor up the way it was left, it left the factory. We then put it through our paint shop because although it's been subject to a 40,000 euro restoration, when you take the bodywork off, they would have scrimped and cut corners and we will go back and fix those problems that are created and it happens with every single motorcycle that we have come across there's not one that we've bought it and gone that's great that's a really good restoration so we will get that bike into investment grade condition and we will prove it we will give them a due diligence file a workshop file with all the photo photographic work and everything we've done to it and it's like that bike has suddenly been given a new lease of life. It's like it's brand new from the factory and we don't over restore. We've got our own in-house paint shop. We're opening our own chroming shop. We do everything in-house to our standard that other people will not work to. That's why we brought it all in-house. We then add value to the customer's motorcycle. So we make uh, very interesting videos about them which we put out on social media so that people know that the machine exists. We, I, I also write for Classic Motorcycle Mechanics at times, and we take professional photographs of the motorcycles being ridden so that if ever they need a road test of that motorcycle, it will often be our customer's machine that is featured, and also in our articles on social media. So we add value to the motorcycle, and when it's time for them to sell it, we sell it for them, and they don't have people coming round to their house. They don't have to deal with, uh, they don't have to pay anything up front like they do with auctions. There is no business about reserves or anything like that. They work out with us what they want for the motorcycle. And we add our commission to that figure. And that is what it will be sold for. Okay, that's great. Well, Paul, we are reaching an investor audience with this interview many of whom will be interested in the, the concept of tax-free tax returns. Can you explain how classic bikes work in this regard and provide some examples? Yeah, certainly. Uh, it's it's a, a chattel, like a classic car. Um, they, they don't see anything as a classic or a non-classic, the tax man. It's a vehicle, and it wastes, and it wastes that I think it's about 20% a year. So they have no interest in it. There's no capital gains tax. There's no income tax. Unless you're trading, if you're sort of selling six bikes a month and saying, well, I'm just the collector, they will charge you VAT on the difference between what you buy and sell it. And they will look, look for income tax. But if you have a personal collection, that collection can go to hundreds or even thousands of motorcycles if you want. There is no tax. 
It's only if you start trading them. And in that time, you will be able to sell them and make a profit and keep that profit. So it's a wasting chattel. Okay. I'm going to bring a slide up now, Paul, with some examples of motorcycles. Can you talk us through these? Yeah. Um, first of all, you've got the 1974 Kawasaki ZA 900. 4,400 in 2010. Um, today, they're 25,000 plus for a proper investment grade motorcycle. They have coded date stamps on a lot of the parts so that you can see whether it's original and whether it left the factory uh, with those components. So those are the ones that are investment grade and they're very, very, very rare. They didn't make a lot of them to begin with. And also the thing to remember with motorcycles, many of them got crashed, made into choppers where the frame was cut, raced, uh, broken up into spares. So they disappear from the market far more than cars do. And they made less superbikes than they did cars back in the day when everyone remembers these things, which is what prompts them to buy them today. Um, Alan Milliard is an interesting character. He makes incredible motorcycles. He's built a Dodge Viper V10 800 brake horsepower motorcycle. He uses the motorcycle broker to sell his vehicles when he very occasionally sells them. And he's very well known because he's on the motorbike show on telly. He's got 4 million global followers. And he's kind of an icon now. Two of his motorcycles are in the Barber Museum, which means that his motorcycles are really sought after. And back in, uh, 19, uh, sorry, it wasn't, 19, it was in 1973, uh, the bike was built. It was in 2010, he sold one of his four-cylinder uh, two-strokes. It went for 15,000. There's one here that an investor owns. If it's sold, it'll go for 65,000 and not a penny less. And that, and it will sell. There is someone out there who will want it and they can't go and buy another one. So they're unique. The MV Agusta 750S is an iconic motorcycle and you have to be very careful of fakes. They mm. made just over 600 of them over a five year period. And you could buy these in investment grade condition in 2010 for 30,000 pounds. Today, a proper investment grade ones, yes, there's cheaper ones, they're not correct. You, there are no bargains in this anymore. Um, you're looking at 125,000 by the time everything's done and it's up to spec and it's right and all the due diligence is done and the factory records are checked. You're looking at 125,000 for one of those, but those are gonna go into seven figures, there's no doubt within the coming 10 years. It's like the Alpha 8C of classic cars. So th those are very, very rare motorcycles. Okay. Well, Paul, you mentioned classic cars there. We will be looking at the classic bike market versus the classic car market in a future episode. Now, Paul, as you know, I've got a 1979 Honda CBX1000. Can you explain to us what has happened to this bike over the past 10 to 15 years? It's remarkable what's happened to the CBX. I always knew that bike would uh, really take off. Its place in history is fantastic. There's a great story behind it. It's a six-cylinder production motorcycle from 1978, 105 brake horsepower. And people used to be very rude about Japanese motorcycles with nasty little rhymes and the day that bike came up that was when those rhymes stopped that was when people stopped being nasty about japanese motorcycles and realized that it was over for the british motorcycle manufacturers and then indeed within five years we didn't have any british motorcycle manufacturers that motorcycle the motor is sort of designed around the design from a famous six cylinder 250 and 300 cc racer that they developed in the 60s. And that, you know, in 2010, you could buy investment grade uh, pieces for 5,000 pounds. And yeah, you always have to do a bit of work to get them up to scratch and you'd have to do that. But you could buy them in amazing condition and they were 5,000 pounds at maximum. Today, 
They're £30,000 and for very, very good reason. It takes an awful lot of work to get them to investment grade if they're, if they're correct to start with. If it's got a different engine in it and there's certain parts missing, it'll never be investment grade. But if everything is correct on it, you're, you, usually we take about eight weeks to turn them around and people look at them and say, but it's perfect. Why don't you put it out the door? Um, there's no way. If you put them out the door, you're going to land a person with a black hole that they're going to be throwing money into. If it's set up correctly, it's fine. And all you have to do then is change the oil every thousand miles, the filter every 2000 and check the valves every uh, 16,000. And it will be fine. Um, but if you if you don't get it up to spec, it will be nothing but trouble, and it will and quite often they will never be right. But that is an amazing motorcycle, and they're going to go to six figures quite rapidly. Um, you know, it was only eighteen months ago they were twenty thousand, so yeah. they've gone up fifty percent in eighteen months. People are cottoning onto them. The FT, how to spend it, spoke about them. That's kind of raised awareness. People are beginning to understand, no, the CBX is the one. Excellent. So uh, we're really seeing some spectacular returns uh, from classic bikes now. Talking about these returns, um, let's have a look at some of the more exotic examples uh, among classic bikes. I mean, the CBX is certainly one of them. So I'm going to bring up a slide now with, uh, not that one, with some Ducatis. Um, can you talk us through these Ducatis, please, Paul? Yes, they're phenomenal um the z stripe they they don't know how many were built it's between 50 and 100 globally so you're probably looking at 30 investment grade pieces worldwide globally um you could buy these for ten thousand pounds in 2010 they're seventy-five thousand minimum today quite often a lot more one recently sold for one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. And if you bought that bike, you'd have to pay 5% duty plus transport and get it all up to shape. It wasn't even running when it was sold. The 1974 750 SS green frame, which has a wonderful story behind it. That was an incredible motorcycle. And that was 40,000 in 2010. In 2012, Ian Falloon, uh, who has written 40, books on motorcycles, many of them about Ducati, and he's a Ducati authority, wrote a book about the green frame, and sure, sure enough, prices went through the roof. You're really looking at around the 200,000 mark now for a proper investment grade one. It's full of fakes, this world. So you have to know that your motorcycle is not a fake. I unearth more fakes than I do genuine ones. Same with the Z-Stripe. Yeah. Carl Fogarty's 1994 championship winning 916 SP. Uh, well, it was an F916, factory 916. Um, that motorcycle, the 916 is iconic. It's very collectible. And uh, it, it won design awards. It was exhibited as art in the Guggenheim Museum. And it won the World Superbike Championship in a real David and Goliath story at a really interesting time in Ducati's history. I was at Brands Hatch for that amazing event where there were 120,000 people there. It was quite something. It was something. And, you, you know, it, it just, it, it's legendary. It, yep. it really is. And they're still enormously undervalued, these motorcycles. If they were cars, they'd be off the scale. Hmm. And, you know, there's only three or four of these machines in the world. And somebody rang me in 2010 and said, I'm standing next to Foggy's bike. It's 25 grand. And I've got a little bit of work to do to it. It's all right. And I know where the front wheel is for it. But the rest of it's easy. Oh, I don't know. I mean, it's a lot of money to pay. And I just said, D just put the phone down and give the man the cash. And he said, but it's so much money. It's too expensive. And I said, it isn't. Put the man, put the phone down and give the man the cash. He did. And he ran me in 2015. And he said, that's the best decision I ever made. I just sold it for 150. Lo and behold, one's recently sold for 650,000. And they're going up. 
um, the, you know, people are beginning to cotton on to this story and the magnificence of the 916. Yeah. The whole Carl Fogarty. Now Carl Fogarty is a sort of TV personality. So the world is changing in those motorcycles. And there's a lot of value to be had in race motorcycles. So the winning I'm a celebrity obviously is well has probably propelled the price prices even higher because of course he is that TV icon now. Well, people sort of say, well, who is he? And then they read the story and go, oh my God, I never knew that. And then when they start talking to people who know about motorcycles and they go, oh, wait a minute. So Ducati was a little bijou motorcycle manufacturer and they took on and beat Honda, Suzuki, Yamaha, Kawasaki and all these giants with all their money and they absolutely tore it up. And they, and they did. Time was amazing at the 916. It was a beautiful bike, still is. Yeah, I, I have a friend who's uh, got a 996 actually, so he's uh, he's sat on that for about 20 years. So um, he, um, that'll that'll be worth a few quid, I'm sure. So yeah, so looking now at uh, investors buying a classic bike, what should invest investors be thinking about, and what should they look out for when they're considering making a purchase? The first thing is. I, I really do a lot of the time have to educate some of my customers because they go, no, I want it cheaper, I want it cheaper. And I go, it is not about what you paid for it when it's right. It's about what you sell it for. And if you had a time machine and could go back and look at in, in 2000, the air-cooled Porsches when they were 20 to 30,000, would you buy the 30,000 pound ones or the 20,000 pound ones? They usually say, I'll buy the 20,000 pound one. I said, so it's the, bike, the car with the wrong gearbox, the wrong this, the wrong that, and it won't be worth very much today. And if you bought the right one at 30,000, I know there's a lot of people selling wrong ones at 30,000 30, back then, but if you bought the right one at 30,000, you'd now have a car worth hundreds of thousands. Wouldn't you rather be doing that? And then they understand. So, for example, this MV Agusta um prototype i've looked at about eight or nine fakes of that bike i think we've found the genuine one i think we have it sold so i can't say too much about it what matters is it genuine is all those key are all those key parts there is there anything that's impossible to find that needs making for the bike because you'd have to make the part now if yep. you had to make it how much would it cost how much does it devalue the bike um so it's about, is it investment grade to start with? Has it got those key attributes? Then when you get it, it might look pretty, but for example, um, how does it run? Will it always run correctly? Is it about to blow up? Um, can the engine cases be maintained? If, the engine, if it's making a noise from the bottom end and you, you realize it's destroyed the engine cases, the bike doesn't have much value because it won't retain that engine number. And it's then about how how do you get that up so it's reset like a new bike. So it's got another 40 years of life left in it. And it takes an enormous amount of work and an, an enormous amount of patience. So, you know, it's not about how shiny it is. And quite often now people are looking back at authenticity our branding is about original spirit so we fake the factory finishes on paints or rather we recreate them but using modern new stable paints so it looks like an unrestored motorcycle but we declare it's been restored we demonstrate it we give people that um the the whole portfolio of the restoration it can often run to over 100 pages with photographs full description showing each step of each process that that motorcycle has been through. So it's like zeroing the bike, setting it back to as new from factory uh, specification. And uh, even if it's been abused, that the, the results of that abuse have all been worked on and it's been brought back to how it should be. And then, Staying on top of it's really easy with anything from the 70s, 80s. It's very easy. But the problem is they're always being run with something not right on them, which causes other problems. Yeah. So it's, about, it's not about how much you paid for it or how little you paid for it. It's about 
how good is it? Because we're at the bottom of the curve and there's a long way to go now for the profits. Yeah. And people care about, is it right? We set rec records at auction, world records at auction, world records by private treaty. And it's because the motorcycles are right. And that's what people want. Is it right? Not how little did they pay for it? So it's stop looking for bargains because they don't exist. And if you think you can sniff them out and that um, you can do better than us, come to us and we'll buy the motorcycle from you, is what I say. And there's never been anyone managed to sell us a motorcycle who claims it. Good. Okay. Well, Paul, it's been great talking with you. And before we wrap up, can you provide a couple of key takeaway points for investors watching this? Yes, invest in what you like in like, get advice. And I would say it's best to buy through someone who knows. Auctions, it's I don't want to speak badly of auctions. It's been a long time since I've seen much value from them. Um the auction sites, we haven't bought off. There. Actually, I bought one for a customer. It needs a lot of work, and that's the first time in five years. And it needs an awful lot of work, massive amounts of work done to it. Okay. Um, yeah. So I would say get get professional advice and let people do their job and while you go and do yours. Great. Well, Paul, uh, Paul and I will be looking at classic bikes versus classic cars in the next show. Meanwhile, Paul Jason, the motorcycle broker, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Alan. It's been a pleasure.